morning, everyone, and welcome to the Navigating the New Prairie Wide Risk Mapping Tool webinar. Uh, quite the title we have today. Uh, my name is Matthew Struthers, and I'm the Provincial Cereal Crop Specialist with the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture, uh, and I'll be chairing today's event. Uh, the main hub for today is your webinar screen and the panel to the side. There are downloadable handouts uh, in the chat box area. The entire session will be recorded, so if you miss anything or wish to revisit any of the material, uh, you can do so after. Uh, these recording links will be sent out later today in a follow-up email. There's also an evaluation form that will pop up at the end of the webinar, uh, and please fill that out as it gives us a much better idea of the topics you'd like to learn more about and help us prioritize research uh, down the road. If anybody has any questions, uh, during the presentation, you may type them in the question box at the bottom right-hand side of your control panel, uh, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible, but may need to limit due to time, uh, depending on how keen uh, you are for asking questions. Uh, your question will remain anonymous and only be sent to myself. Uh, during the presentation, we'll keep you all muted, uh, so that way there's no feedback or interference with the presentation uh, presentation's audio. Uh, before we jump into it, I do have some quick slides. Uh, the first one is just about the uh, Crop Commission field tour on June 26th in Bigger. Um, you know, uh, make sure to get out and, and visit that day. Uh, lots of things planned and it should be a very good one. Uh, hopefully the weather's nice. Uh, next, we have Sasquatch's uh, Summer Classic. Uh, they're focusing a lot on AI and agriculture. Uh, that is June 19th, uh, coming up in a couple weeks during Canada's Farm Show. So again, if you're going to the Farm Show, you might as well sign up for this. They give you a free ticket to the show. Uh, crop Diagnostic School is on once again this year. Uh, it's in Melfort uh, from the 24th to 25th of Ju July, um, and uh, there's a lot of a lot of different stations that are held there. Uh, so come come one, come all, uh, and make sure you sign up because uh, I know those seats are being taken up quite quickly. Uh, lastly, I'd like to uh, just jump into a little bit about the presentations we're having today. Uh, the FHB risk map was developed through the collaboration between uh, the University of Manitoba, the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture, Manitoba Agriculture, Alberta Ministry of Agriculture and Irrigation, along with the support of many crop commissions from all three prairie provinces, including Sasquatch and Sas Barley. The goal of this project was to create a new prairie-wide mapping system, uh, mapping platform designed to improve producers' understanding of their FHB uh, risk and better assist their fungicide applications. I would like to thank the funding sponsors of this tool, the Canadian Agriculture Partnership, Ag Canada, Ag Canada, Integrated Crop Agronomy Cluster, Brewing and Malting Barley Research Institute, SAS Wheat, Western Grains Research Foundation, Manitoba Crop Alliance, Alberta Grains, and last, last but not least, the Prairie Oak Growers. With us today to give us a walkthrough on how to use the FHB risk mapping tool, is Dr. Paul Bullock from the U of M and Timmy Ojo from Manitoba Agriculture. Today's presentation will be followed by a live Q&A with both Paul and Timmy, and Alariza Ockovan, uh, Provincial Plant Disease Specialist, will also be joining for the live Q&A. So, um, Timmy, you're, uh, you're up first. You'll get a prompt to share your screen, and then uh, you can take it away. Okay, thank you for that, Matt. Um, can you see my screen? Okay, it's just a black screen showing Google Chrome incognito. Uh, yeah, I can see your incognito mode, yeah. Okay, great, thank you very much. And yeah, I wanna welcome um, everyone to today's webinar and thanks for the invitation. So Paul and I would be tag teaming to give this presentation today. And we thought that we would start with showing you what the viewer actually looks like so that when Paul um, goes into the presentation you would have an idea of what it looks like so that's what that's the jump jump off point today we are starting with um, just showing you what it looks like so from any browser I'm here on my Google incognito just type in the web URL the address is prairie so it's P R I R I E Prairie FHB, and we made the URL quite simple, easy to remember. Um, so prairiefhb.ca is the link address. And when you type that into your browser, 
Uh, it's oh, it's actually because I've been in here before. Ideally, you would see a splash page that shows you that you are welcome to this viewer and um, just some basic information like that. So once you accept that um, that page, you would get to this initial home page. And this home page um, provides you with just basic information about the purpose of what this page um, is to do. So it provides advanced ad assessment of potential FHP damage to Western Canadian cereal crops. And then just a bit of what the risk parameters are. So this tool gives you not just the FHP index, but also the FDK, which is the Fusarium Damage Kernel, as well as the DON, um, that's the mycotoxins that is produced by FHP and then goes further to acknowledge the funding partners as well as data partners as you would see in this presentation um, the tool that we've developed uses a lot of data um, but the, the the meat of the project is actually you can either access the mapping tool right from this home page or you can go at the top on the tab so there is the map or there is the use risk mapping tool so you would not miss it at all. Wherever you are on this page, you would see the use risk mapping tool. So I'm going to click on that. And oh, yes, this is where the terms of use shows. And this is just for us to let you know that efforts have been made to ensure accuracy of information that we've provided. However, there is no model that is 100% accurate. And so this is us telling you that, you know, use this information, but you are encouraged to conduct field observation to verify the information that we provide on this tool. So um, I would expect that you would click accept to get into the tool. So once you click accept, you would be taking, you, you would see this page. It's a blank map um, page. And there is a stepwise approach that shows you how to use the map. So there's the link to use the map and it goes through a step process. So the first step is select the filter to narrow down the desired map view. So if I go to next, it asks me to select the date of interest. By default, it's usually on the first day, um, on, on the day you are visiting by default. So today is June 4th and that's the date that is there. However, if you click on the calendar, I'm going to go back. If you click on this calendar icon or anywhere in this box, you can type in the, um, oh yeah, no, you can't type in anymore. We remove that. It's just the calendar um, icon that you click on and you can use it to select any date of interest. So right now I'm selecting May 30. Um, you would notice that future dates are grayed out and that's because you can't have any um, risk um, the this risk tool does not forecast what you would see in the next few days. It's based on historical weather data um, over the last 10 to 14 days. So, and this tool is only available from May 15 to the end of August. So if I go one month back to May, you'd notice that May 1 to May 14 um, is grayed out. And that's because FHP isn't, um, we, we don't expect that we would see any FHP pressure um, before May 15. And even in uh, uh, mid to late May, you would only see this in winter cereals, in winter wheat, for instance. Uh, most folks are still seeding or completed seeding already. Um, so this tool only is available from May 15 to the end of August. Then moving on to the crop type, we in this project, we have developed models for four crop types. So winter wheat, spring wheat, barley and durum. And um, so you'd select the crop type of interest. Then you go on to the next um, step, which is selecting the variety. So what we've done is we've selected, we use the seed guide from each of the three provinces over the last four to five years to put in the variety of interest. Now, if you click on this, it would show you all the various varieties that are grown across the prairies um, in all the three provinces. So there's a very good chance of 
very high chance that you would see your um, the the variety you are seeding listed. So this is for winter wheat. Um, I can select elevate. Um, in terms of spring wheat, once you click on the crop type, the previous variety you'd selected would disappear because the variety would, would be crop type specific. So you would have to click on this variety box again to have a list of all the various varieties that are specific to that crop type. So AAC Brandon, for instance, for spring wheat. Um, and I should note that regardless, right now at this stage of development, we are still collecting data, but at this stage of development, all the varieties would actually give you similar risk type. And I'm gonna get to that shortly. So once you select a crop type, you select the variety of interest. The next thing is to select the risk that you are interested in. So I mentioned that we set out in this project to um, look at three risk parameters, the FHP index, that's the Fusarium Head Blight Index, the Fusarium Damage Kernel, and the DON. However, because of the three years when we had conducted this um, research were more on the dry end of the spectrum, we did not see as high a disease pressure as we would see in a wet year. So we weren't able to see enough disease pressure, for instance, that would give us statistically, inf um, statistically um, relevant information to develop a model for done for spring wheat. Durham is the only crop type that we had enough data points to be able to develop the risk at all three, all three risk parameters. Um, for winter wheat and for barley, we only add FHB index, no FDK and no done. Um, the goal is that we are continuing with data collection and as more and more data is being collected, we hope that we would have enough data points to be able to um, statistically develop model that would again, um, give us information for all three risk type for all four crop types. So I would go back to spring wheat, select my variety. Oh, I would actually show something without selecting the variety. Um, if you go and show results, it's actually going to give you a warning and it would say, please add a variety to see results. So if for any reason you forgot that step, it's going to remind you. So if I go back and I select these, um, there's also an option to select either the specific province of choice or to look at the risk across the prairie provinces or three prairie provinces. So um, in this case, I'm going to select Saskatchewan because that's where we are today. If I click on show results, it would show me the Fizerum Ed Blight more risk result for spring wheat and just for Saskatchewan. If I'm interested in seeing all the three prairie provinces, I simply go to the province and click view all and I click on show results. Now it shows me the results across all three prairie provinces. Um, Dr. Bullock would go into further details about some of the um, development and what we did in terms of developing this tool. Um, but something I would quickly note is this tool is um, location um, dependent as well as weather dependent. It solely relies on weather. We are using weather as our risk factor. So. Um, if your crop is not at the stage that is susceptible, so cereals are usually susceptible around the antisis period. So this data that we've used, the data we've used in developing this model is based on 50% um, antisis, what we observed. So the weather condition 10 to 14 days before mid antisis was what we used. So if your crop is still at the you know seedling stage, tillering stage, and your location is showing very high risk, that does not mean that your crop would be experiencing or would have FHP because it's not at the growth stage that is susceptible yet. Um, one of the things that we also did with this project was to include various levels of resistance because many folks would seed um, resistant varieties. And um, with again having the slightly the dry dry end of this of the um, spectrum, we did not see statistically significant differences among the varieties. So if you look at this variety, um, and I go to let's say AAC awesome, 
and I click show result, it's still the same. So regardless of the variety you select right now, the models are still the same. However, as we collect more and more data points, we expect that there'll be varietal differences in terms of how the varieties respond to Physerum, Ed Blight, or to FDK or to Dawn. Um, I would also want to note that it's not just a one-time um, information. You can go back on here. If you want to see the progress, how, has, uh, how is the risk changing over time, I can simply go and select the next day, May 31st, and click Show Result again. And you can see that there is a slight difference now in terms of the risk. It's still, I'd say, around the <clears throat> eastern um, area of Saskatchewan and the western part of Manitoba, those are the areas that have a higher risk. And um, if the crop is at that antisy stage, if I go to June 1st and I click on show results, now there's a slight difference again. And you can do that and progress through time to see how the risk keeps changing. So going to today, for instance, um, the risk is lower than what it was last week although we still have some what I would call hot spots. So the risk legend right here gives you an interpretation of what the colors yeah, that has been displayed on the map, what the colors mean. So when you see green, it means there is low risk. Um, yellow is moderate. The red is high and the black is very high. Right now, we don't have any very high risk. Um, we do have high risk in some areas, but I don't think anyone's spring wheat would be at the antisy stage as of today. So I know that even if this is showing high risk um, around Millville and Yorkton area, um, that does not mean there is disease on um, FHB on the farm. It's just showing that based on the previous 10 to 14 days weather, the conditions are conducive for the development of the disease. So that's um, a quick overview of, of what the, um, the, the tool does and what it looks like. Um, a few other things I would note is that this map that you are seeing comes from almost 500, over 500 um, weather stations. And right down here, there's a little hamburger um, icon on the bottom right corner. And if you click on the station, it actually shows you the weather stations that are just a simple dot of various weather stations feeding in into this tool. Um, we, are, we have been improving the number of stations we have in Saskatchewan. We're hoping to have more stations. Um, we keep adding new stations as, as they come online. Um, so, and the other good thing is you can export this data. So if I click on export right there, you can export the view. So um, I'm going to go back. I'm going to close it here and go back. If I'm interested in the prairie, everywhere in the prairie, and this is the view I'm interested in, or if you're only interested in your area on the farm, I want to send it to someone, you can just zoom into that area and click on export. Once you click on export, by default, you have the map details already displayed. So it has the dates, the crop type, the variety, and the risk that you have selected because the risk will be different for different risk types. So again, I'm going to close this and we'll go back to the risk. Instead of choosing FHP, what if I choose the Fusarium Damage Kernel? I'm going to just zoom out again um, so that you see the broad. So if I choose Fusarium Damage Kernel instead of Fusarium Head Blight and I click on Show Results, it's all green because it's a different risk type, it's a different model. So um, depending on the risk type that you've selected, it will display various um, risk information. So if you go and export, now it's showing Fusarium Damage Kernel because that's the risk type. You can download this and send it to the farm manager or send it to um, whoever you want to send it to. And we also put a disclaimer right here, again, to say that efforts have been made to ensure accuracy of the information, but there is no model that is 100% accurate. So you are encouraged to conduct field observations to verify the information that you are seeing on this tool. 
Um, a few other quick things just for one minute or so. Um, the weekly crop reports, uh, Mindsova, Saskatchewan and Alberta, all three, Ministry of Agriculture, do issue weekly crop reports. We thought it's a really, really good information. So if you click on Saskatchewan, for instance, it would take you to the uh, most recent crop report information um, from Saskatchewan. Um, and then just the last thing is the frequently asked questions. So there's just this page that shows frequently asked questions in terms of if you want to know more information. Um, one of the things we've also really um, been fortunate with in developing this tool is the collaborative effort from all the ministries and all the various provincial um, commodity associations. So if you do have questions, feel free to reach to your provincial um, specialist about this as well. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bullock. Um, Paul, did I miss anything that I should point out, or do you want to take it over for your presentation? Um, I think everything's good, Timmy. I, I think there's enough here to kind of get into um, into uh, you know how this thing works and and how we developed it. So yeah, that's what I'll do. Okay. All right. So hopefully um, everyone can see uh, my screen here now. Yep, looks great, Paul. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, Timmy's given a very good um, uh, briefing about the actual tool itself. What does it do? You know, it maps out this risk for fusarium. Um, you can zoom into a province or your own area. You can export. Uh, you can. You have to select your crop type, there's all the different types of risks that are available on it. And, and usually the question that follows that is, okay, how does this work? What is, how does it actually do this? So um, let me get my thing to go here. So that's what I'm going to dive into. How does this thing work? And Timmy already said that what it's doing is uh, collecting the um, uh, using weather information to to turn that into a risk. So that's how this works. It collects weather information and it uses that to calculate risk. And just the same way, if you see a vehicle park somewhere, how does it move? You got to lift the hood and have a look at the engine. Okay, this is the engine. Underneath, in and behind the scenes in the mapping tool are a series of equations, and each of these equations are used to calculate a risk, a specific type of fusarium headlight risk, okay? So, as Timmy said, the type of risks are the fusarium headlight index, you know, what you would actually see in the field if you went out and did a count about three weeks after mid and thesis. Um, there's there's uh, the fusarium damage kernels that you would find uh, in, in the grain itself once it's harvested or the mycotoxin deoxynevalanol, which is, can also be measured in the grain. So if you have a look at that, um, that first model for winter wheat, the fusarium head blight index model or, or equation for winter wheat. And what you see there is this odd looking factor in there, RH8014MA. And what does that mean? It's literally the number of hours over the previous 14 days where the relative humidity was 80% or higher. So it's a count, how many hours. And, and, and so it's using that metric at every weather station to come up with a, a risk value. For spring wheat, you see it's a little bit different. Okay, spring wheat has this RH max 14 MA, but it also has this T2528 14 MA, all right? So the RH max 14 MA, that's the, the mean maximum humidity over the previous 14 days. And the T252814 is the number of hours that the weather, the air temperature was between 25 and 28, okay? So it uses two factors. I'm gonna show you a table in a few minutes with all the weather parameters that were used to develop this. There was, there was over 80 different weather parameters that were considered. and all of them are a way to quantify how favorable is the is the um, weather for development of fusarium head light. So all of these um, reflect that. They're either some type of relative humidity, air temperature, or rainfall. 
that's being that's being utilized. Okay. So what we did was we tested, like I say, over 80 of these. We looked statistically for which ones were giving us the most accuracy to what we were observing in the field in terms of, of um, FHB indicators. And when you look at these, you know, like the more uh, hours you have with relative humidity over 80% uh, or higher, the higher the risk. Well, the models also make physical sense. They're, so they're statistically robust, but they also physically could reflect what we expect to see. So this is an example of what of what we call a logistic regression. So the, the, the tool uses a technique called logistic regression. And in logistic regression, you have to define something called an epidemic, okay? So this is an example of spring wheat fusarium damage kernel, a logistic regression equation, okay? And if you look at the left-hand side, you can see it saying, what's the probability that FDK is greater than or equal to 0.3%? Okay, more on the, on the uh, thresholds here in a minute. So anytime that you measure FDK of 0.3% or higher, it's called an epidemic. And it's just something that we defined that way. If it was less than that, it's a non-epidemic. So what you end up with is you end up with a series of... Um, in the field when you're measuring this you have either epidemics or non-epidemics and what the uh, logistic regression equation does is it creates an equation that best fits a model to that transition from where it was a non-epidemic to where it's an epidemic that's that's the the basic principle behind it now if we look at the actual spring wheat fdk risk model um, this was using uh, the mean daily relative humidity over the previous 10 days. That's the weather factor that's being used. And there's the probabilities uh, along the y-axis and they're split into categories, low, moderate, high, and very high based on the statistics of those epidemics and non-epidemics. So how does this um, actually work then in the model? So for every weather station, over 500 weather stations on any given day, um, that relative humidity, that mean relative humidity over the previous 10 days, over each, each of those hourly time frames, is it's calculated and then it's plugged into this equation. And depending where you end up along the x-axis, you go up to that equation, it'll tell you you're in a low, you're in a moderate, high, or very high risk, okay? Now, in this particular model, this is a mean relative humidity. So within the, within the mapping tool itself, there's a check. We have to have at least 90% of all of the data points in those past 10 days, hourly data for the past 10 days, we need at least 90% of those values, or it considers if it doesn't have that, it doesn't calculate it, okay? Because we don't want to be calculating spurious values at a weather station because of missing data. For the the weather parameters that are a count, you remember the number of hours between 25 and 28. So that's just count. How many hours was it like that? There is zero tolerance for missing data. So if there's any missing data on a count, they're very sensitive. That, that weather station is not included because then that you could end up with a, with a problem. Okay. So that's how we deal with the missing weather data that might creep into this. Okay. How do we define epidemics? So we used for fusarium head blight index. So this is what would be visible in the field for, uh, with infected spikelets. We use a, an epidemic threshold of 5% or higher. For fusarium damaged kernels, there were different epidemic levels depending on the type of crop. So we, I already mentioned the fact that we had 0.3% you know, for spring wheat. Well, why 0.3%? 0.3% is the threshold. If you meet, if you get to that threshold and go beyond it, your wheat is downgraded from number one to number two. And so this is the values that we have used for FDK reflect the maximum amount that you can have in the number one grade for each of the different crops. And that varies according to the Green, Canadian Grain Commission. So that's what these values uh, for epidemic threshold represent. 
and it gives you a point to be able to say, yeah, um, you know, this is giving me the risk that I'm going to reach this particular FTK threshold. And if you do reach that, well, then it is going to represent a revenue loss because if it downgrades your cereal from the number one, well, then there's actually a loss of revenue uh, when you deliver the grain. For Dawn, one part per million, one uh, milligram per kilogram is what was used. And of course, that often can be um, a detriment to marketing grain uh, is when the Dawn level starts to creep up to one part per million or higher. So that's what was used for epidemics. So Timmy showed the, the risk maps, how you can zoom in to specific areas. And so what's happening then is that for each of these little dots, you can see that's a weather station, okay? So uh, every morning, the risk mapping tool reaches out to all 500 stations and pulls in the last 24 hours of hourly data. Okay, so that's updated every morning. Then it goes through the data at those stations and it calculates those weather parameters that are needed in the models. So it calculates what's the, the mean relative humidity over the last 10 days, how many hours between 25 and 28 degrees. It, it calculates each of those values for every weather station. And then for every weather station, it then goes through those seven different models and it calculates the risk of that particular type of fusarium damage. So that's done for each of those little gray dots that you can see on the screen here. The maps themselves are composed of 10 by 10 kilometer grid cells, okay? So if you zoom right into this map, you can zoom into a 10 by 10 kilometer grid cell. This map is not gonna zoom into your individual field. That's too high a resolution for this type of risk map. But 10 by 10 kilometers is still enough to be able to show um, your local variation, okay? So for each of these grid cells, what's happening is that individual grid cell is, it looks around to the 12 closest weather stations to the grid cell, okay? As long as they're within 50 kilometers, that grid cell, and it does an interpolation called an inverse distance weighted um, interpolation of the value for that grid cell, okay? So that's how the map itself is produced. It takes the individual values from each of the weather stations and it weights a value for each grid cell and then colors it according to whether it's low, moderate, high, or very high risk. Okay, at this point, I think what I'll do is I'm gonna throw it back to Timmy um, and uh, let him deal with a, a question that came up about the motivation for all of this work. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Paul. And that's something that we do get quite often in terms of why did you start this project? What was it all about? And we started this project actually after 2016. So if um, the audience would remember 2016, seem to be the last really wet year we've seen across the prairies and that year actually had a very high um, FHP pressure um, many crops were I mean yeah m m the harvest was downgraded for many farmers and I think there was an estimate that across the prairies we probably lost about one billion dollars worth um, of value from the downgrades so and, and um, at, at the time we were doing installing weather stations across the province in Manitoba and a producer actually asked us that why is it that the Manitoba and Saskatchewan FHB maps are sometimes similar, sometimes very different, I don't know which one to use and that was one of the motivation for creating this map and before then each of the three provinces do prov provide um, FHB maps However, the maps at the time were based on, uh, the, the models that were used at the time were based on information developed in the US. They were never validated on the prairies um, in any of the three provinces. They were pretty much done, um, conducted in the US and we decided to adopt it because we did not have any information that is better. And looking at the slide that Dr. Bullock is showing, this was for the same day um, on June 30, 2020, and you would notice Saskatchewan in the middle. The legend is 
three um, information. So it's low, moderate, high are the three um, various categories. Contrast that to Manitoba that has four categories. So even right there, there is quite a difference in terms of what the legend is showing. And if you take a look uh, right to the southwest corner, I'm uh, sorry, southeast corner of Saskatchewan border and the southwest of Manitoba, you'd notice that in some of those areas, so let's say just right close to the border, Manitoba is showing moderate and Saskatchewan is showing moderate to, to an extent. But then if you go slightly up around Mosumi, um, Saskatchewan is showing moderate, Manitoba is showing high. Um, and there's always that the, the mismatch. And that was one of the, I'd say, the driver for creating something that is prairie wide, such that regardless of where you are on the prairies, especially for producers that farm right along the border um, between Manitoba and Saskatchewan or between Saskatchewan and Alberta, um, you are able to see a prairie developed risk model to use for your risk map. So Paul, I think that's what I have on that. I uh, will turn it back to you to discuss kind of where the models come from. All right. Hey, thanks, Timmy. All right. So where did these risk models come from? Well, to develop the actual models that uh, I showed you on the previous slide, this uh, plot study was undertaken in all three provinces. There were plots in 2019, 2020, and 2021, 15 sites, five in each province. And they were spread out geographically to provide a range of weather conditions and FHV occurrence, because you need that range in order to create a model. Um, and so that's, that's how they were done. So these are the sites where we did the, uh, the plot study for those three years. What did the plots look like? Well, each plot site included winter wheat, spring wheat, barley, and durum, which of course are the crops that are showing up in the model. For winter wheat, spring wheat, and barley, there was actually three different varieties grown of each one. One of those varieties was in the susceptible to moderately susceptible category, one was intermediate, and one was resistant. Okay, so there was three of each of those uh, uh, crop uh, varieties grown. Durham, there was just one. Everything that we had at the time was either susceptible or moderately susceptible. So when we were done, we selected the varieties that were going to give us that range. And at every one of those 15 plot sites, the same varieties from the same seed lot were grown right across the prairies. So any differences that we saw in fusarium levels was a result of the weather and did not, it was not a reflection of difference in genetics or resistance. Okay, those, uh, those uh, varieties were the, were the same in all 15 sites. At every one of those uh, locations, uh, we installed a weather station alongside, okay. Um, what they would do is they would give you uh, wind speed direction, solar radiation, rainfall, temperature, and relative humidity. So these are portable stations. They were calibrated prior to each growing season and uh, uh, made sure that they were giving us uh, consistent and accurate data before they went out to the plot sites. At the plots, we had to um, take some very critical observations. And one that people maybe don't realize, but this is very important to stress. We needed to determine when each of these cereal crops reached mid-anthesis, okay? So there was a specific crop stage that we wanted to know what date did it reach that, okay? So that meant that there was observations that were taken of crop stage once the uh, crop got close to the reproductive phase. And what we wanted was uh, to, to identify that 65, that was the uh, BBH, BBCH 65 was the time marker. So when we look at these models, and you may recall, so spring wheat FDK uses the mean relative humidity for the previous 10 days. What we did here was we found the date of mid anthesis, and then we looked at weather parameters that were the preceding four days or seven or 10 or 14 days. So that 10 days prior to mid anthesis for relative humidity, that's what we found was most highly correlated to the spring wheat FDK. So that's why knowing the stage of your crop is really, really important because these models are meant to reflect the risk that occurs 
in that time period just ahead of mid end thesis. So we assessed the FHB index. You can see the uh, um, uh, photo there in the uh, lower right that shows a fusarium in uh, infected kernel or a spike, count the number of spikelets, and that gives you an index. That was done about three weeks after that 50% uh, flowering date. And of course, the plots were harvested. The grain was sent to a commercial lab so that we got an official grade that included a fusarium damaged kernel count as well as got a dawn test um, that, at the same time. So that's where we got the FHB um, risk um, parameter data from, was from these, each of these plots. So to develop these, um, these models, we needed weather predictor variables. And we used over 80 different ones. Uh, you've seen some of these already in the models that were selected. There was a range. Um, there were models that, um, that, well, different time periods, four days prior to thesis, seven days, 10 days, or 14 days. We also had one that went from the time period three days prior to three days after um, mid-end thesis. But we've concentrated on those first four time periods in order to create models that could give us the risk by the date of end thesis so that some type of a fungicide spray could be decided upon based on the modeled risk. So the variables, we had some that were mean daily, like this is mean daily rainfall, that's being shown there. Some were a count, okay? So the duration or the number of hours of a certain type of parameter for over the, the, the time periods um, above. Um, and then some that were a combination. Okay, so in this case, the duration where the air temperature was 15 to 30 degrees and relative humidity was greater, greater than, equal or greater than 90%, okay? So these were selected not randomly, but based on research that had been done into fusarium risk models uh, at other locations. Okay, so the other question comes up, okay, fine, so you've got these models. How accurate are they? How well do they work? So the statistical performance for these models um, are summarized. There's a summary given here in this table. And there's a lot of different methods you can use. But this table shows measures that are rather, you know, are, are fairly intu intuitive to try to understand. So if you look alongside each of those models, there's a, there's a column that says sensitivity. Well, what is that? Ability, that is the ability of these models to correctly identify true positives or epidemics. Okay, so when a model predicted, yes, there's going to be an epidemic using whatever that epidemic threshold it, it was selected, how frequently did the observations match the prediction? Okay, so sensitivity, how well does it predict a true positive? Specificity measures correctly identified true negatives or non epidemics. So if a model predicted a non epidemic, how frequently did the observations match that? Accuracy is the combination of correctly identified epidemics and correctly identified non-epidemics. So it's a combination of the two. And you can see that these models, when they were uh, developed, had accuracy of 75% or greater. And I can tell you from looking at other models around the world, that's, that's good performance from, uh, from uh, any type of a disease model. The last part of the, of the field work uh, it was very important, um, and that was to try to validate these models developed in the plots. So how well did those Fusarium Hen Blight Index, FTK, and Dawn models work when you use them in producer fields? And these uh, are showing locations of producer fields that were used to validate the models. There's over 300 of them. And the question we were asking, were the models that were developed from the data in the plot study representative of the same disease risk that could be explained in a producer field that had not received a fungicide. And this is important because that's what these models were designed to do, is to be used as a management guide in producer cereal crops. So again, the, the fields were distributed right across the prairies to try to maximize the variation in weather conditions and disease occurrence. So when we look at the performance, the same performance of the same models, <clears throat> using those same parameters in producer fields, what did we find? Now, what you're going to notice here is that 
for winter wheat, barley, and durum. When we looked at sensitivity, we ended up with a blank. Timmy mentioned 2019, 2020, and 2021, the three years that we did the study were definitely warmer and drier. They were not high disease pressure years. And in fact, we ran into a problem trying to find enough epidemics to test that end of the models. We had lots of non-epidemics. So the specificity, we could, we could uh, uh, evaluate very, um, very well. But for sensitivity epidemics, we lacked data. So that's definitely, a, that's a bias that's in these models. And it's the reason that even now we continue to collect more data, both from plot and from producer fields, certainly not 15 plot sites per year. That's a, that's a big project to manage. But we're adding data all the time to try to improve the accuracy of these models. And we expect the models will change over time as we add data to them. Now, just a point to note here, we did this um, evaluation of these models with these producer field data sets that we had for the different crops. We used the old FHB risk models that were used in the different provinces and tested them as well. And what we found is that these new models did perform better. So they're not, these models are far from being perfect and they do require further data collection and data points to increase the performance but they are an improvement over what we had previously and we ex expect to see them continue to improve over time. With that, I will turn it back to Timmy. I think you wanted to talk about where people can actually access these maps if they, don't, if they didn't want to uh, go directly to that prairiefhb.ca. Yeah, um, definitely, Paul, and thanks for that, you know, the overview. So yeah, if anyone is interested in accessing the maps, they can go directly to prairiefhb.ca or like I mentioned before, we have such a wonderful collaboration on this project with all the three Ministry of Agriculture. So I know in Saskatchewan and Saskwit um, in the past would have the map for the FHB on their website, but now on Saskwit's website, um, they also have information about this mapping tool this new mapping tool um, that we have. So all three provinces are on board with it and um, it's such a great privilege to be able to go through this project and continue with this project with um, the provincial specialist with the Commodity Association, um, giving us such a wonderful um, collaborative effort with what we are doing. So um, feel free to reach out to your provincial specialist if you have further questions or reach out to us as well. Uh, but yeah, if you go on the Sasquit website, it, you, you'll be directed to the prairiefhb.ca as the resource to use. But beyond the risk tool itself, there are so many other important information about FHB that you would find on your provincial um, agriculture website. So I'd encourage listeners to visit those. Awesome. Well, thank you very much uh, to the both of you for your overviews and, and presentation on uh, on the tool. Um, I'm hopeful to, to use it throughout the season. Hopefully risk is low. I don't want anybody out there with uh, bad FHB, but uh, um, we will jump into some questions. So I'll remind uh, the, uh, the listeners, the audience, that if you do have a question, type it up in the chat box uh, and we will read it out. So uh, the first question is, what weather stations are you drawing from in Saskatchewan? How can we help with data collection to have a more robust collection of data to improve the map? So uh, take it away. Sure. Yeah, that, that's sure. such a great question. I'll, 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 yeah, yeah, go ahead, Timmy. Yeah, so in Saskatchewan, we are drawing on, actually across the prairies, we are drawing on Environment and Climate Change Canada because they've got a good network of stations, not as dense as we would like, but that's a primary source of weather data for us. In Saskatchewan specifically, we've also added weather station from the Public Safety Board. They've got about 35 weather stations that we've added um, to Environment Canada's, I think about 20 stations from around Canada, 
well, about 30 station member in Canada. So 30, that's give about 30, 60. Yeah, 30, yeah. yeah about, uh, about 60. And then we've also added Metos Canada. Metos Canada is a private um, network of weather stations that meant some producers are already, um, they have subscription to Metos Canada. And that's, uh, I'd say the latest push that we've had is from producers that have their own weather station through Metas Canada and are willing to contribute the data to assist with this project. So I know there was a call that went out um, about a month ago or so. And um, But if producers are listening and they are still interested in allowing us to have access to the data, um, they simply would. Well, Paul, do you want to talk about uh, the process for them to, to get their data on board? Yes. Um... So yeah, Metos Canada is, is kind of our latest uh, weather data partner, and uh, they have uh, a number of uh, people who have privately owned weather stations in uh, in Saskatchewan, and so we we're trying to tap into that to help increase the density of stations in the province. If a, a producer uh, has a, a, a Metos or PESSL, P-E-S-S-L weather station. Metos Canada can't share that data for us to use in the mapping tool without explicit permission from the weather station owner. Okay, this is called ag data transparency. They have certification for that. So they require explicit permission. You would send that permission to sales at metos, M E T O S dot C A. Hi, this is my station number. This is my name. I would like to support the FHB risk mapping tool and I am giving you permission to add my weather data from my station to that which is being collected to be used for the mapping tool. That's That would be the process. Yeah, can I quickly add to, to it as well, Matt? I know sometimes we've had questions from other weather station host that just have their own weather station and want to add it into this tool. One of the things that we try to do is to ensure that the data we are collecting one is um, have a very well rigid QA QC, so very good quality control into it. So we are at this point not able to just take an independent station from one person without having gone, gone through that rigorous process of making sure that there is that the data coming in is one that we can trust although we still have our own threshold that we apply um, because sometimes even a good weather station can produce bad data sometimes so we still have our own thresholds but we want to make sure that information coming in is from reputable sources that, that we can trust awesome thank you both we will we'll definitely send out some uh the sign up sheet and the instructions uh to the attendant uh, the attending uh audience um at the end with the evaluation so um, that's that's really good. Uh, one thing I did uh, forget to do is introduce Alariza. Uh, thanks for jumping on the Q&A. I do see some questions that, uh, some curveballs for you to answer here. So uh, we will jump into the next question because we are running a little low on time, but uh, is there any relationship between this risk mapping tool and the previous tools used across the prairies? I know you talked about it a bit um, throughout your presentation, but is there any relationship from how you collected it before to now and, and uh, maybe just touch on that? Okay, so the, the the previous the previous uh, risk FHB risk uh, algorithms that were used did come from research that was done in the United States. They took a very similar approach. They used logistic regression. They used a number of weather parameters that would impact uh, fusarium. And uh, I don't think we've got any identical weather parameters in these tools to the ones before. There might be some crossover. But anyway, they, yes, they are. Um, they, they, they come from a similar stock. Okay. The difference is the models that we have in the tool were actually developed here in Western Canada using our own crops and our, our own weather conditions uh, and, and fusarium species in that. So yeah, they uh, would they be related? I would. Uh, you, you might even find some correlations between them. We haven't checked that, but um, but yes. Uh, the, the 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 old models did come from a similar type of pedigree. Awesome. Uh, Kate, next question is: Have you determined the density of acres per weather station that is optimal? You know, I know in the maps that Alberta and Manitoba had a bit more than Saskatchewan, so uh, just maybe touch on uh, if you've come up with an acreage per per weather station or not. 
no we, we did not conduct that um as like to check but you know i it would be nice if there is a weather station at every um section <laughs> that would give us such a huge <laughs> density um but that's not um realistic uh, and this is meant to provide a regional or a pre review uh, and that's what I think Dr. Bullock talked about, the 10 by 10 kilometer grid is what we try to achieve with the interpolation that we do. Um, but I would say th the more stations you have, definitely the better it represents the local conditions. Correct. Yeah, yeah maybe one day we'll have a station on every single section. Uh, it might be a while for that. Um, the next question is, recent uh, research in Manitoba shows a growing level of F FHB in oats. Is there a reason why they weren't included will it be considered in the future? Okay, I guess maybe I better answer that since I kind of go back to the origins of this study and the discussions around it. Um, we, you know, was a reason not to, in, in, there was a reason we, we could have included it, but but the uh, the practical one was that it just, every crop you add to a plot study with 15 sites and all that kind of thing, is a huge addition of cost, both in terms of having the plots, analyzing the data, all that kind of thing. So it was it was mainly a cost consideration. We can add whatever crops we want, you know, uh, find the right researchers and give them enough money, they'll do it. Okay, but but that's that's really that's really what it boils down to at the end of the day. Awesome. No, that's a great answer. Thank you. It always boils down to cost, right? So maybe down the road, a uh, big, uh, big lump of money will just fall into your lap, and then that's that. So uh, the next question there you is, go. yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> won't be for me though. Uh, will the will the map be able to capture and take into account localized weather events such as just a few inches of rain? Yeah, the, if there is a weather station at that location, it would definitely capture that. Um, but I want to say beyond rain, and none of the current models or equations that Paul showed actually had rainfall. And that's because we noticed that humidity was a better determinant of the disease occurrence than rainfall. The previous model that I know Manitoba uses actually uses the number of hours of rainfall. But we noticed that sometimes you have two inches of rain in an hour. And that counts as one. But if you have the same, two, um, if you have like half an inch that occurred over 10 hours, that counts as 10. So we noticed that humidity was a better um, prediction of the um, of the observation that we were seeing than than rainfall. Very interesting. Um, okay, one quick, clarification: uh, Bar barley does use average daily yes. rainfall. The barley yes, model does. Barley. Yeah. yeah, it's the only one. A uh, nice easy one here is, uh, what if my variety that I'm growing is not on the list? Yeah, so right now the varieties actually, did, we did not see any statistically dif um, significant difference regardless of the variety. So it wouldn't matter which variety you select right now. Um, and that we think is also because the disease pressure was low in those three years that we conducted the study. We did see some differences, but they were not statistically significant. And that's why at this point, regardless of the variety you select, it will give you the same risks. So I would say go ahead, select any variety and you'll be okay. As we move forward with the project, we expect that we'll be able to tease out more statistically significant differences. Perfect. Uh, Kate, this one's a little bit more for Alariza, but uh, what crops are the high are at the highest risk, risk for FHB? Uh, we shouldn't be using this as the only indicator for FHB risk and what other things should we be doing? So what crops are more at risk? Uh, yeah, and then uh, what else can they be doing plus this tool uh, to mitigate that risk? Yeah, so uh, first of all, thanks uh, Paul and Timmy to accept the invitation, give this very great uh, talk. Uh, again, uh, uh, it was, it is, it is, this is an area that uh, Timmy actually touched based on this very well, uh, that when maps suggest high risk, then there are other factors, factors need to be taken into consideration before actually uh, making decision on if and when to spray. And uh, of course, in general, uh, what we believe from the data from the other uh, serial uh, uh, survey we do in the province for, uh, for, for, uh, for wheat and durum wheat and barley, 
is most of the time the room comes to the uh, more uh, susceptible uh, kind of area. So kind of the room wheat is more susceptible than spring wheat and then spring and, uh, and barley is less susceptible than those uh, two types of wheat and oat is uh, the least susceptible kind of stuff. But again, uh, I guess Timmy fully covered this uh, when it came to the question to the to the uh, to the topic of other factors that needed to be consideration when the map suggests high risk uh, and and again timing and crop staging is the most important. So perhaps I also use this because this is now ten. Uh, so I use this as an opportunity to of course thank everyone who joined this uh, today's webinar and thank Timmy and. And, uh, and Paul and yourself and Ali and Ashley in, in behind the scene. But also I wanted to especially thanks the Saskatchewan producers who collaborated with this project since 2019 and those who continue to collaborate, collaborate this year. Again, as Paul and Tim both mentioned, the model will uh, continue to stay alive and to improve by adding more and more uh, data from producers peers as well. And we just started uh, lining up the fields uh, for, for this year. So I wanted actually to send my special thanks to all Saskatchewan producers who helped us uh, throughout since 2019. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great note, Alariz. It is after 10, so we will wrap. Um, so thank you again for the walkthrough and the great presentation. And Alariza, thank you for the, uh, the Q&A, as well as uh, Timmy and Paul. Um, and then thank you, everyone, for attending. So I appreciate the time that you took. Um, Please fill out the survey once you uh, exit the system. And if you have any questions regarding agriculture in any in any realm of it, uh, please contact your local SaskAg office. Uh, there's a lot of staff there that are, are willing to help you out. Uh, and you can reach the Ag Agriculture Knowledge Center at 1-866-457-2377. Um, and thank you for joining today's session. So have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Bye, everyone.